Okay. Perfect. Are we recording already or? Yeah, we are recording right now. Perfect. So we can okay. start. Um, welcome everybody. This is the fifth webinars of um, Restart, the project organized by Utopian within the initiative uh, Repubblica Digitale organized by the Italian Ministry of Innovation. Uh, we're very happy to have you um, here today because we are going to discuss about a very important topic nowadays, which is how to use technologies for social good. And uh, to talk about this important topic, we have an amazing speaker with us today. Um, welcome, uh, Lina, to, to our webinar. And thank you very much for accepting our, our invitation. So thank before you so we much start... Oh, it's, it's really a pleasure. And um, so before we start, I, I, give, you, um, I give some background to, to our attendees about you and, and what you do. Um, so Lina is the uh, founder and CEO of the FERO, a social enterprise employing and supporting vulnerable women, such as refugees and former trafficking victims, and they produce healthy yet very delicious uh, sweets. She is also the creator of the Refugees, a virtual reality simulation of a refugee's journey from Syria to Germany, um, which is an education and impact tool. She uh, has experience in building international entrepreneurship um, ecosystem. She received her master in Georgetown. She consults the United Nations, the World Bank, and she's a G20 Young Global Changer. So she's a living example of how to use technology um, for doing social good. So just before we start and I give the floor to Lina, I will just um, recap how we're going to proceed with today's webinar. So first of all, we will have a short presentation and then we will open the floor to Q&A. Um, so you can ask your question through the chat, but if you want to, um, to intervene uh, in a more active way, you can just let us know through the chat and we will open your mic and your camera. We are now, um, um, doing the webinar with um, muted mics uh, because, of course, it's, uh, it's easier to, to follow the presentation if there are no background noises. But feel free to, to join us also in the, in the discussion. So I think we can start. Um, this is all on my side. And thank you once again. And Lina, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Luisa, for such a kind introduction. Um, so how my first 10-15 minutes of the presentation will go is linking common factors of how technology is used in the field of social impact, social entrepreneurship, development, and humanitarian fields, and relating it to practical examples on the field that I had worked on. So through analysis, we find that three of the main uh, ways that technology is used in the field of social impact the first is using technology as a storytelling and connection enabler. Two, it's using it as tools for data gathering and collection. Three, it's using it for pathways to education and employment. So I'm going to connect these three large spheres with a projects that I have run. So first of all, storytelling and connection. Back in 2013, I started a project called Breaking Barriers where the whole um, scope of the project was to break barriers in culture between uh, different ge geographies and to kind of help enable um, the overcoming of stereotypes and common forms of racism that, that usually come when you're not in direct contact with what you don't know. So what we did over the course of over eight months was connect students in person at the University of British Columbia a webinar live streamed globally that anyone from anywhere in the world could access and ask questions with different, um, different places in the Middle East and covering specific topics. We covered everything from the role of women in, um, in Middle Eastern society to how business works to how perhaps religion can influence uh, arts and science. And so by, go, by doing, giving people this type of direct connection with people on the ground, we were able to overcome stereotypes and help and enable people to ask those awkward questions that when you don't have a, a proper platform, you feel uncomfortable to ask and that just perpetrates stereotypes in the back of your mind. Now you see very effective and very interesting projects that are still ongoing. You see, for example, shared studios. They have an incredible um, 
example where they, they've kind of converted uh, a container, a shipping container into a shared space. So one that I experienced at the, at, in Washington DC, which is very engaging, was you walk into this container and the other side of, con of the container is connected to a refugee camp in Erbil, Iraq. So you are able to contact, to speak directly with refugees living in a refugee camp and you can ask any question that you have. And that really dehumanizes the, the perception of the other. It, um, sorry, it humanizes the perception of the other. It allows to build that type of human interaction. Yes, it's not the same as being face to face or next to each other, but is as, cl as close as it gets to you going into the refugee camp in Iraq. And so you see this type of, of use of technology as a way for creating connection, uh, either directly with people uh, face to face or as a tool for enabling storytelling. And I'm going to go into the second project now, technology as a storytelling enabler. Uh, another project I ran is called V Refugees. Uh, so it is the virtual reality simulation of a refugee's journey from Syria to Germany. And it captivates all of the nuances that it takes over that on average month long journey that in the media was being portrayed as this mass entry by foot of, of refugees into Europe and really propelled a lot of the political backlash that happened in Europe. It fueled a lot of what happened with Brexit. And so the goal of the project was to show, well, how does this journey actually look like why are people being pushed out of their homes to even take this and really put the other person the best way to really create empathy is to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes and so that's what we try to do uh, the project had several different components with it which is what often comes with the difficulty of of integrating technology with storytelling with a humanitarian um, crisis but we, so it was working with three very different groups. We interviewed refugees who had done the journey directly. So it was a collage of real stories that had happened, then working with anthropologists and storytellers to build that into a collective narrative that as best as possible could, could gather, let's say, the, the journey, many journeys in one. And then the final piece was translating this, this in a way, photojournalism and video journalism in virtual reality. We chose uh, to use virtual reality um, graphics instead of video because of the technical difficulties of the team. We were just unable to recreate that type of journey and go ourselves into Syria. But by creating it in a video and comic format, uh, we were really able to, to have multiple stories in one. And now the difficulty with that comes that what a storyteller uh, thinks and what is practically possible from a technolo technology standpoint and wanting to stay within budgets and within time frames, those are very different interests pulling at the same time. And I'm happy to go more in depth on, on how you can integrate these three narratives and uh, make it fit within either your timeline, your budget, uh, whatever the needs are specifically of the organization or if it's a student and personal project. For example, I was doing virtual, I was doing B-Refugees while I was a master's student at Georgetown. So that had certain nuances that I brought specifically to the project. Now, going into the third bucket of how technology is most commonly used, that's as an enabler towards education and employment pathways. As uh, Louisa mentioned with Dafero, uh, we, we sell healthy and delicious sweets, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's possible. Um, and we use part of those proceeds to create life skills and employment skills programs, specifically for refugee and trafficked women. But lately we made a coronavirus course and the mental health implications of COVID open to all families that might need some extra support and that find that the fake news and, and the conflicting information that they're receiving is not allowing them to make the healthiest and safest choices during the pandemic. So uh, with our core project at Stuff Pharaoh, what we did is uh, collect and create open source a course on critical life skills, everything that uh, an individual needs to be successful and self-reliant in their new community 
as well as on the workforce if they do choose to enter an employment path. And so everything from financial literacy to early childhood education, nutrition, rights, health, all of those skill sets that more people than we realize are lacking because either they were uh, youth in transit and didn't have a guardian to teach them those skills, perhaps they were an individual who was unfortunately taken in trafficking rings at a young age, so they didn't have a guardian who cared for them and could properly teach them those skills, or perhaps the culture where they came from and the new community they were settled have very different approaches to those things and it's not as systematized. So the course that we have is delivered, it's mobile based. So it's fully responsive either on your cell phone or um, on a computer, desktop, iPad, anything that is uh, web responsive. And individuals take these micro courses in about 20, 30 minutes. It's estimated the average time of a commute. So instead of aimlessly scrolling through Instagram, you can take this course fully free, it's meant as an enabler for um, NGOs and grassroots organizations. And they can progressively acquire the skills. There are some elements of AI-based learning incorporated in it. So as people learn, and as they demonstrate that they're absorbing the content, we can adapt the content furthermore to make it more engaging, more interesting. And then we have an employment pathway where it's a form of digital apprenticeship. It, it actually was aim to be in person, but coronavirus forced us to make all of our programming uh, digital, even this apprenticeship we weren't expecting. And this is a form of employment training. So how can we help individuals as successful as they can when they're shooting for a job interview? Uh, how can they more importantly retain the job? Because it's often much more difficult to stay in a job and keep that job rather than just get it in the first place. So all of this is enabled um, through, um, through online programming. Uh, we're working on having the technology work two ways. So, so an outwards facing technology is when you're just providing an individual um, a service, uh, uh, we can call education, for example, education as a service that we're providing people these courses to take. But then inward technologies, you are receiving something from them. And what we want to enable is to receive data that helps uh, uh, in an anonymized manner. So completely detaching the individual's personal responses and uh, their identity to the general responses, but having uh, in critical information such as um, gender, family composition, their specific needs, uh, how many children do they have in their household, what's the average literacy rate, and many other um, many other data points based off of zip code that would allow governments as well as humanitarian and development service providers to plot on on a map what's the needs assessment here we thought that we needed a new elementary school in this zip code but it turns out no there are not that many children actually in need of this elementary school we, we actually need an adult literacy center in this zip code and so it will allow in the long run government and service providers to allocate resources more effectively. We all know that data collection and survey is extremely difficult to, to uh, grasp, especially from vulnerable pop populations such as uh, refugee, refugees or newly come migrants or other individuals at the margins of society. It's very hard to reach them in the first place and even harder to, to grasp any any of the critical data information. So creating two-way technologies when you're providing a service for free or for a fee, and then receiving that type of data that in the long run will really help um, that same population. Um, we're exploring more and more of these types of, of effective technology tools. Um, so I'm happy to, to go into questions. There's so much to talk about this topic, um, but if anyone has any questions right off the bat, feel free to ask me. Thank you, Lina, also for giving us really like um, a framework and an overview of what you do, uh, which are your projects. Um, you know, I have many, many questions to, to ask you, so um, I will start with one of them, probably the, um, 
the first that comes up to, to my mind and it is um, how did you come up with the idea of creating projects like uh, the refugees or the fire with where did you get the inspiration to start with those projects? So for V Refugees specifically, it was when the um, uh, refugee crisis was exploding in Europe. And um, you would see these images on the buses of London, um, masses of people walking and they made it seem like they're just casually walking into the UK in thousands when Geographically and physically, we all know that's actually not possible. But because it's pulled on the emotions and the tension that many people were feeling in, in society, that unfortunately proved to be an effective tool in, in changing people's perception. And so what I thought was, how can we create a counter narrative? How is it possible uh, based off of what the media is portraying and what politics are portraying, what how can we respond in the most effective way possible but also directly taking the voices of those who are effectively the subjects of this narrative because there are many many projects and many many initiatives where we talk about refugees or homeless or formerly incarcerated or those with substance abuse but none of them are on the table of our project none of them are providing direct input none of them are are truly telling their story or more effectively a collective story and so that was really the input of of the refugees it was including the subjects back in um, the story and helping them tell how things really are and hopefully um, demonstrating to people that the reality is much different and that nobody risks their lives or their children's lives just because they want to walk into Europe and, um, and take advantage of the general system, but that there was a true need and a true uh, instances of violence back home that pushed them to take that journey. And in the, in the V Refugees narrative, you see the crossing between Turkey and Greece. Uh, so the Mediterranean is the deadliest route for refugees globally. There are more refugees that die in sea in the Mediterranean than in any other route. And that wasn't spoken as much. And wh why are people taking these boats? Why are people having and being pushed into such uh, a dangerous um, route? And so I really wanted to show that. And one of the final scenes, uh, not to give it away, but um, in the refugees is that when this this boat that we're showing that the the user puts on the headset and they are a refugee in the boat so they're going in the boat and when they almost arrive in greece all they see are uh life uh life vests hundreds of life vests and hundreds of clothes and shoes and children's toys and it's a very strong and visual graphic but that was actually what people saw when they arrived in Greece. So they felt hope and relief to have arrived, but they felt grief for all the other hundreds of people that they knew had died in that exact same point. And this, I heard this over and over again when we ran the interviews and it was such a strong point. And how do you demonstrate that? How do you show that instead of the bus in the UK and people just casually walking in? I have a follow-up questions actually. Um, how did you, because you were mentioning that you run interviews and I was curious to know, how did you build the story and um, how important it is to have also in the team different, because you were mentioning also in your presentation before, to have different voices and, and skills and how to, to organize them so that the story is really representative of, of what they, they're going through and then how to put it actually in, uh, into the technology. So the, the storytelling interview process was very extensive, um, in a way very emotionally draining. I was a master's student, uh, not prepared for, for those stories. I thought I was, and then it turned out I really wasn't. Every story on average, uh, the interviews lasted from three to five hours because every individual told us every single step of the way. It wasn't just a quick summary. 
in the end it's one to three months of a person's life in an interview so every interview was extremely in-depth and a very uh, detailed because we want to capture the individual narratives then uh, we worked with an anthropologist and a storyteller to see okay we have these several stories the stories represented many different people female male younger unaccompanied minor older adult with families we really wanted to capture many different uh, people at different stages in their lives and then we took this collective narrative and we saw what were the points in common so we found certain geographic points as the points in common so how do we create that from a to b to c and we sometimes for some people that route a to b was not eventful for person one but for person two a pretty catastrophic thing happened in point a to b so we put persons two in that small geographic segment then we have b to c person one and person two nothing much happened they're just but in person three there was an event and so we put that so that's how we really collect collated the narrative it was looking at what types of overlaps happened almost throughout the narrative and how can we put in individual stories that really represented it happened to this one person but in reality it happened to thousands of others and so we we kind of had to work between what's always the same and what was unique and different and uh putting that uh also identifying what type of of constraints we might have from a technology perspective so uh v refugees was built on unity engine um very common gaming software um it's it's you lots uh, if not most of uh, video games are built on unity and many vr platforms are as well and but our team was very small we didn't have fifty thousand hundred thousand dollar budget to work with this so um in unity you have different pieces or our unit so the tree is put on purpose the street and all those little units you have to either find them somewhere in an open source or, or buy a platform or create from scratch. It takes a long time to create from scratch, looking at 3D perspectives. So we had to really battle with these two of, of what we could practically do with the budget specifically that we had. And that's how we chose, um, that's how we further defined the narrative and the story. Um, yes, I, I invite everybody to, to jump in the conversation, whether using the chat or if they have a, if a question they want to ask directly to, to Lina, just let us know. Uh, but I would like also to, to follow on the fact that um, this is also for as an education tool. And we saw during the pandemic that technology is playing a big role in, uh, in education. We also saw it in your other project in the Faro and how you're building this uh, digital apprenticeship and also this, um, this video through which they can, they can learn other skills. Um, so what do you think that after the pandemic, the role of technology for education will be? Um, do you think it will be increasing or do you think we saw the shortcomings and, um, and so we will kind of abandon some of the, of, of what we learned during these times? I think there will be a mix because you look at what university professors are saying, engagement has never been as low. So yes, it's great that we can listen to a lecture in our pajamas, in our dorm room, but I'm not as inclined to raise my hand or the, the technology lags makes it very difficult for me to debate with 30 other people in my classroom as opposed to an in-person setting. And we, many, many educators saw this, highlighted this also, um, even if it's not in a larger classroom, as individuals, it's very difficult for us to, to maintain concentration over Zoom and truly understand what the person is saying because there's always some form of lag in technology and those micro movements that people have in their eyes and their forehead muscles, those little movements that we don't think consciously but our brain processes, we can't really see those. Either the picture is too small or I hear your question three seconds after you tell it, at that point the narrative has gone. And that's why people are having a very hard time concentrating and feeling a lot of fatigue. 
because to be able to analyze those movements and that that those nonverbal gestures that we process in the back of our mind automatically now we have to be really concentrated and so that's even more exhausting um so i think there will be uh i definitely don't think that in-person classes are dead i think of my own undergraduate experience and i took summer classes those are my lowest engagement classes and i had only one as opposed to five in a semester but so i do think that it's as much as we can we can tell the hard facts and we can teach people skills to maintain engagement i still think there's a long way to go now that said i think technology has really proven very effective to learn those hard skills and those micro facts so not a full three hour lecture from your philosophy professor but a 20 minute skill that you have time to while you're in the supermarket or while you're somewhere else and that case has proven very effective because we as we know we don't concentrate for more than 40 minutes at a time so if you can shorten that to less than half while you're in a in a busy moment you can actually concentrate more and absorb that micro skill and then just get on with the rest of your day so that's for example why we made um, the life skills program which 90 percent of that content is hard skills it's things that you can read in a book it's just that we made it so easy and visual in slides for anyone, even those it's meant for those with five, fifth grade and up literacy rates, even as adults. Uh, you can observe that content real quick. You don't have to sit for three hours, five hours in a class learning 50 new things that not even one sticks. And so I, I really do think we're going to play with those two, two different aspects. Um, and how we're going to solve that online engagement, I'm very curious. I'm not an expert in that specifically. Thank you for answering that question, Lina. We have a question in the chat, so it's from Roberto. Um, I have a question about Lina's entrepreneurial journey. Were the US just a natural choice for a firm such as the Faro? Which piece of advice would she give to anybody wishing to start a business in the European Union? Um, so I started in the U.S. because I, I finished my master's at Georgetown, so I was already living there, and then I was working at the World Bank. And I, Dafero didn't start off with an idea, let's start a food business with a social impact focus. Dafero is very much an organic growth. It was uh, a need, a need that was I tried to fill by providing employment with uh, one woman over the weekend making this completely new product that the US had never seen called date spread. And in a way, it started almost as a, as a community service NGO project. We were, I thought I would have to push the sales of the date spread to help this one woman uh, feed her family. She had uh, five children under 10 years old and she um, had uh, her husband had a debilitating back injury, so he could not work. So she was the only provider, but did not speak English and had arrived in the US less than six months before. So it was very hard for her to find a job. And so I thought that we'd have to push the sales of the date spread. What actually happened from a product perspective was a pull. We had so many people interested in the product. It grew so much more from just my colleagues and my friends buying it to stores wanting it. And so I would say that, that the specific affair journey was not exactly planned how it went. It was very much a typical entrepreneurship. I had a need, I made a product, the community had a need, filled that need with a, a specific service and then married those two things together. We're very lucky and very grateful that it turns out that the market really wanted this type of, of things and pull and had, was, had a pull factor and then escalated through there um i believe roberto's second part of the question was how the european union is in, in yeah um, which piece of advice um, would you give to anybody wishing to to start a business in the in the european union so myself i have not started uh, a startup registered in the eu so uh, in terms of the, the technical perspective i can't give that much feedback, but what I can is understanding the European consumer from, from that side. So Europe, we have 
more than 40 different subcultures in Europe and what somebody's needs in Germany are so different from the UK and how we talk to those people are incredibly uh, different. Uh, what I see as what, what I look at and what my friends who are working in, in startups in the EU see is what are the underlying trends that are happening? What are people looking for? It sounds silly, but actually Instagram hashtags and based off of the language that they're posted are a very good indicator of whether there's a need for something. So for example, in the food industry, I had found more than 30 different recipes of how to make a date spread at home, not a single person selling it. That shows that people want this if they're willing to do the effort of making it themselves. And so that, really, that showed a gap in the market. Then we, we've created more advanced trackers. We do data mining on uh, tracking everything from social media, uh, Twitter, Quora questions are, are really great in demonstrating high level interest and then matching that with data and statistics. This type of process, it pretty much transcends borders because you see people put an output and now thanks to social media and, and direct messaging, they can actually demonstrate their needs and what they're interested in it and what, what they want. And then you cross and compare that to actual data mining and um, not just, oh, my three friends say that they love this idea. Friends are useless <laughs> to go way, way beyond that. But comparing those two things and then comparing it to, to data and market trends, what I see is when you see the intersection of those three, that's when you have uh, the sweet spot in the market for whatever product or service you're doing. And, and that really does show a direction. Now, I work a lot as well with uh, thinking by design and, um, and the iterative process, not telling people, okay, I have this perfect thing for you, now you have to buy it. Uh, very much going through the iterative uh, process. And um, the nice thing in Europe and in the EU specifically is that we have so many hub zones and innovation zones where there are basically clusters of companies, startups, and public-private partnerships working on a specific um, specific topic. And so that's great because that's like a built-in ecosystem, which is very hard to find. Uh, honestly, it's, it's less common in the US. Of course, excluding uh, Silicon Valley and the tech boom and then biotech in Boston. But in the EU, it's very much a public-private partnership. It's very much built with the community in mind and the cluster of companies that work on a specific topic, whether it's ag tech or technology specific, uh, whether it's manufacturing, um, EU is the leader in environmental sustainability. And so a lot of environmental uh, startups and material uh, designing and R&D are coming out of Europe. And it's very much thanks to those clusters. And so I would say doing that customer perspective analysis and then doing the ecosystem analysis because you might have found the sweet spot, but how are you going to make it? If nobody has done it before, why not? How are you going to practically turn this thought into reality? And that's where the EU's uh, innovation ecosystems and clusters really come into place and are very handy because they can act as enablers in that, uh, in that environment. We have another question from the chat. Um, so Amalia, um, wanted to tell, wanted to tell Lina, so you, that um, your work is really inspiring. Thank you for giving this talk and sharing your experience. And she has two questions. So first is how many um, people work in your projects, um, for example, in selling the Swiss project, and do they do this, um, do they do this on voluntary basis or not? And the second question is, what about linking this wonderful project to civil engagement projects in school? Could puppies be involved in order to learn more about refugees? Yes, so for the first question, we go through a rotational program from the, no, uh, the women are not volunteers, they work, they gain gainful hourly employment, and um, they move in four to six people at a time in terms of uh, in-person apprenticeship. And then for the digital programs, we're actually switching the model and giving it directly to organizations and NGOs. So right now we have an uncapped limit on how many people can actually 
go through the technology. It can be 100 people. We can even have 100,000 people go through the platform. And right now, that's exactly what we're doing. We're working on scaling the, the, the product against uh, across different geographies and giving those in different languages so that community-based organizations or local governments can then distribute it to um, the nice thing about technology in this specific case is that we have an unlimited cap which is very different from the in-person there's only so many people in person we can train right but with these specific life skills tools it's unlimited because we found uh, a way to hack the um, scalability across the, the domain and hosting. So that's that's really exciting. And then from the, I believe she mentioned like the, the public uh, partnership and how uh, these types of projects can be incorporated in schools and the public domain. So if uh, pupils could also be involved in order to learn about um, more about refugees. Definitely. So part of the refugees is, to, is uh, all of the projects that I've specifically done are meant to be as enablers. We create the tools, the content specifically that takes such a long time to do partially because storytelling takes so long or research and development takes so long, but then give it to organizations so they can be enablers and they can really scale that impact. So we're definitely open to, to having schools be a part of it. They uh, just need a VR headset or, um, or mobile phones in, in, in certain cases and just have the most important thing with uh, scaling it through organizations is to have champions because people can like the idea, but if they don't truly understand it and if there's not one or several individuals to champion that idea, then it'll get kind of lost. So we really look at when we scale our, our projects is looking at intrapreneurs. Who are those individuals within certain organizations that are enthusiastic about a topic, that are ready to help it get to the next level? And in the end, everything we, we do is given for free to the organization. So it's very easy for them to uptake as long as they're a strong enabler. So if anyone is interested in, in using the products and using the courses and, and anything, just reach out to me. My name, Lina Zdruli, on LinkedIn is, is the same. Uh, just reach out to me and I'm happy to share all of those, those tools and information because the whole goal of it is to really scale impact. Thank you, Lina. So I have another question. Um, I couldn't agree more with Amalia. I mean, your work is really inspiring. Um, but um, which were the challenges that you faced? It must, must have not have been that easy like to, to come up with the idea and to realize it and, and to, to like put it into, into action. And, and also, what, what, which is your advice for someone who has an idea and, and don't know, like, doesn't know where to start, basically? So in terms of challenges, I'll talk about the affair specifically and our social impact. In the beginning, I thought that it was enough to give hourly employment to refugee women in the area. And after uh, six to 12 months, they would have uh, experience, have built the confidence and have a US based uh, reference to then do a job closer to home. Because being in Washington DC, there's not that many refugees. Almost everyone comes from further in Maryland and Virginia. So it takes some time to come. So it was meant as a, as a stepping stone to local employment. What happened in reality is that the women we worked with needed so much more than just hourly employment. They needed that whole host of skills that is even confidence, even soft skills like confidence, like interrelational, um, interrelational uh, skills. How do you deal with coworkers? How do you deal with conflict at the workplace? Some came from cultures where it was rude to ever say no. Others are, are used to being much more direct and that can be seen rude in the US. So I learned, and I had no idea about this before starting, is that, wow, we have so much work to do in the pre-employment space. And that's why we're focusing on this right now to enable people to uh, move forward. But that, I would have never learned that if I hadn't done the minimal viable product of let's just try it. Let's just have this one woman who does need a job to make this one jar of date spread. Let's just go for it and see how it goes. The label was ugly. 
the recipe wasn't finished. We were making it in a small kitchen, small commercial kitchen that didn't have most of the equipment. It took forever to make. It was in the beginning, the commercial side was a joke almost because besides the great taste and the mission, it was completely inefficient. But how could we have learned? That's the only way you really can, unless of course you start off with a large investment from someone or a large grant from the EU and you start off with 100,000, 500,000, 1 million uh, dollars or euros and then, then yes, you can launch a huge project. But the only way to understand the problems on the path are when you're on the path. I joke that I, the only reason I started all the projects I did is because I thought it was so easy in the beginning. I thought, oh, it's quite easy to make this, this job. Oh, it's quite easy to, to take this narrative. Turns out it takes at least five times as much money and three times as much time as you think. But if you don't think it's easy from the onset and you already know how hard it is, you have to be crazy to still go in it. So the characteristic of an entrepreneur is always a touch of craziness because maybe deep down, even though you set it aside, you know that maybe this is impossible or maybe this is too hard, but I'm just shutting myself down to it, but you still go for it. And so I would say that no, no matter what, because there are so many different frameworks for what you're doing. If you're doing a product, it's so much different than a service. If you're going, if you're selling directly to businesses, B2B, it's so different from selling directly to customers, B2C. So there are many, many different frameworks. It's hard to generalize uh, across every industry and every type of business. But I would say the number one uh, in the beginning is always research because I had, I, I have a great idea every other day, or I think I do. And how many of us had a great idea in the shower this morning? How many of those great ideas already exist and we didn't know because we just hadn't done research? And um, if you look at the theory of ideas and how ideas come, innovation, it's, it's almost a mathematical formula. And the same idea can happen in Mumbai as it happens in Manhattan. And those two people I've never met and I have never had the same experiences. But that's just how our systems, of, our systems work have we actually done our research and that exists or not? Um, and then two, research on is there even a need? Maybe it doesn't exist because nobody wants it. Nobody wants a, a coffee flavored chewing gum, maybe, because I expect to be minty fresh. I don't expect to smell like a cappuccino. I eat the chewing gum after a cappuccino, do not smell like a cappuccino. So why maybe looking into why people never wanted this cappuccino flavored chewing gum in the first place? And then uh, if you manage to get to the minimal viable product, it can be a one page of your service. It can be you doing the service yourself. It can literally be the product that you want with a piece of paper on it and make the cardboard. And, but can you sell that idea to 50 people that don't know you? Your mom does not count. So the 50 people test, do 50 people buy this idea? The nice thing, since this is a technology webinar, the great thing about technology is that we can almost make a fully visible looking product online. You can make a really nice, let's say this cup, you design this cup and you want your face because you love your face and you think everybody wants to buy your face on a mug uh, type of product. You don't have to go and manufacture it, which takes hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can recreate this image on Photoshop. It looks real. If you look up mock-ups, it looks real, does not take that much time. Yes, you have to learn Photoshop, but then you can do what's called A-B testing. You pay for ads on whatever channel it is. If you're directly to business, you go to whatever channel business is directly. If it's customer, customer. And then it leads to an empty link. You don't even have to build your website. You don't even have to build a full product, but you see how many people are clicking on uh, what you are selling. This is a very cost effective way of seeing if what you are, you want to offer appeals to a broader, broader public. And the nice thing with marketing, you can target 
whatever type of demographic and geography and, and type of customer that you want. And then you actually see, are people clicking this thing and are they trying to buy it? Or nobody is clicking it at all. If nobody is, then that, that shows that there's something there that's not working. So you don't have to throw all of your life savings into an idea only to find out that nobody wants it. So there's lots of nice ways that we can use technology to really lower the cost in that initial phase. That's very interesting, but I was wondering how um, social entrepreneurship, so entrepreneurship with a, with a social purpose, um, can be better fostered and promoted, and whether, because there are different environments, um, I'm sure that the US environment is um, it's very different from the UN, but um, what role can um, public institution and the state play, and um, how in, on the other side can uh, entrepreneurs better interact so that um, more social entrepreneurship is, um, is happening? Well, that's great that you asked about social entrepreneurship because if you talk about how the government can act as an en enabler, well, look at the legal structure. Less than uh, 10 countries in the world have any form of legal entity that allows you to classify as a social enterprise. The UK has been a pioneer in this, uh, as well as Malaysia. But it's very hard to find a country that has a specific legal designation as a social enterprise. And so most founders have to choose, okay, do I just want a private sector company or do I want to start a nonprofit? Okay, well, if I start a, a private sector company with regular investors, but I want to have a social impact focus, does that hurt my earnings? How can I demonstrate that the social good I'm doing is actually good for the business as well? And then you look at the nonprofit side, you can't actually invest in a nonprofit, you can only receive grants. And so that limits the amount of funding, especially in the beginning that you can receive and, and how you start off that. So if governments and uh, consortiums of governments like the EU want to help, number one, create a legal structure because that will allow to access different types of funding. If you're a company, you can only access certain types of, of government um, resources. If you're an NGO, you can, only, you can only access grants. So how can we create a cross structure for that? And then in terms of creating the enabling environment for social enterprises, there are some amazing organizations that exist. You look at Skoll Foundation, Ashoka, Acumen, World Economic Forum Global Shapers. There's so many amazing uh, organizations that are trying to support social enterprises, let's say as a whole. Most of those programs, you have to be a little bit more advanced in your social entrepreneurship journey for them to see that you've proven this model and uptake you and help you grow. Um, so actually what I'm uh, working on right now as well is creating a form of consortium and certification program that can help social enterprise founders directly signal what uh, what their product is because you you pick up a product and you see all these symbols you see fair trade incredible you see vegan or organic or b corp you have specific designations but there's no designation that's universally accepted as a social enterprise and so we're working on creating that designation so that when a customer goes to the store and they pick up two shampoos and the shampoos look natural and quite similar but then you see the shampoo that costs $4 has a sticker that says social enterprise and that creates an immediate signaling in the literally three seconds that you have to capture a customer. Oh, this product does more than the good it does for me. It, it does something else. And right now, that's really what customers are looking into. You look into data, more than 97% of customers want to see some form of either sustainability or social enterprise. They see it as a positive thing in a company that creates more brand loyalty. Um, you actually see impact investment funds. They've, they've fared weather in crisis than traditional funds. And that's been proven on and on again, especially from a supply chain sustainability perspective. Um, so if anyone is interested in, in learn, this uh, certification is very much uh, uh, in the mid stage. So we haven't launched it yet, but if anyone is interested in understanding this process, understanding the social enterprise ecosystem, had an organization that would like to partner um, with this, uh, please let me know. 
Thank you also for the for this invitation. Um, well, I don't know if Roberto wanted to, to ask something because I, I heard some some noises, but um, I honestly have uh, another question, which is also related to the role um, that can be played um, by governments as a neighbors, but also the ecosystem. Um, and it also reflects what we are seeing every day um, from a couple of months now. So I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic showed us that there are um, really big issues in, in our economic system, and our social system, and, and that there is a lot to be done. And I was wondering, what is your take on the role of social entrepreneurship after the crisis? Um, so I think there is a sort of need for a new way of thinking about entrepreneurship. Um, especially now that we saw all the all the problems and issues that we are that we are facing, and so I would be really curious to know what you think about. I think this outbreak has really shown how much people are attached to and care about uh, ethical companies, about a form of sustainable capitalism that helps everyone win, not just few people win. You see how much press and how much news companies that, for example, donated uh, masks to medical workers or in food companies donated their foods to, uh, to healthcare workers or in some way or another were involved in society. You see many service and education-based companies give many of their resources for free. And so this has really been gathering news. And as a company and as a social enterprise, to be on the news, to be newsworthy is very hard. And you really always look for that and you try to pitch your story and you have your media kit. The fact that this is news and this is news every day and it's positive news really shows a signaling. It shows that people care. It shows that a company is not just meant there to be, uh, to just provide the service points blank, but how are you a good citizen as well? In the United States, a company is effectively a citizen. It, it detaches any form of liability to the individual, right? So in, in that perspective, you have to demonstrate that you're a good citizen. And that's really why I see social enterprises being much more relevant and much more interesting in this in ecosystem from uh, a customer perspective. Because and social enterprises should be inherently ethical. They should inherently be a conscious member of the community that wants to do more than just the individual profit of the product. And so I really do think you see in the EU, um, more than one in four new enterprises this year were social enterprise. And so that really demonstrates from a founder perspective, but even from a market perspective, how much need there is for this. And I think what the pandemic showed is that it's not just good hearted people who want to create change in the world and good, but it, it really does make market sense. And it shows that people want to buy from these types of, of companies. I think I didn't answer the second part of your question. Feel free to tell it to me again. <laughs> um, no, I, I also have like a very practical question actually related to the pandemic. How, how is your company coping with the, with the issues regarding the pandemic? Um, especially since you're uh, giving work to vulnerable women, how is it going for her during these, um, these, these hard times? Yes, yeah, so um, it's two sides. So on the one side, we've actually found more sales and more engagement. Luckily, we had built inventory beforehand. So it really shows that people want to eat healthier, um, that these types of products resonate with them, uh, that uh, you actually see studies in the in U.S. specifically, and people have gone back to their unhealthy childhood flavors uh, because they're using food as comfort. So luckily, us being in the sweet spot of being tasty and, and being comfort food, but that's actually good for you and builds your immune system, uh, we found that sales were higher. From a supply chain perspective, things have been very difficult. Uh, we had uh, the places where we make our foods either had to uh, shut down or had to temporarily close. And so uh, dealing with that from an inventory perspective was quite difficult. Um, on the flip side, from a social impact perspective, we actually were able to implement even more programs. We created a brand new course in less than a month. 
on, um, on what the coronavirus is, what the pandemic is, and how families can better uh, face the mental health implications, because that's something that's critically important that we're not talking about as much. Uh, yes, of course, the health side is incredibly important to social distance, but what does that being in one room, either alone or with a certain number of people all the time, what does that entail from a mental health perspective and from a productivity perspective? And especially for parents with young children, how do they battle those two roles that they never had to usually do at the same time? Um, so two very different, <laughs> different sides, but supply chain with a physical product and risk never work well. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to maintain a proper supply chain operation when you have a physical product and there's a crisis. And realistically, there's going to be a lot more crisis because of climate change, which is not being addressed as much. Um, but that is definitely something that uh, we have on our radar and how to, um, how to balance that. Like, yes, I, I agree, like environmental environmental issues are also something that we should look more. I think even before the pandemic, there was more discussion going on, at least a bit, uh, but there is a lot to be done. And uh, and thank you very much for sharing your, your, your experience and how you're dealing with it. I know it, um, it's hard time for, for a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and yeah, how to, to cope with the pandemic. It's a, it's a big issue and will probably still be in, in the coming months. Um, I don't know if we have other um, questions. Uh, yeah, we have a thank you message. So thank you, Lina, the business insights you provide are extremely valuable. Uh, My but, <laughs> um, yeah, so if there are no other questions, I, I think we can, uh, we can close the session for today. And um, thank you very much for, oh, no, there is a question. Amazing. So Roberto, would you like to, to ask it directly or through the chat? We cannot hear you. Wait. We still can hear you. <laughs> he asked which is Lena's uh, okay. preferred flavor of date. <laughs> well, I think the date is a perfect fruit. So it's fantastic on its own, but my favorite the fair date play date spread flavor is our brownie batter we're the only ones to use organic cacao powder and it's thick and it's delicious and you can really tell the quality and full of antioxidants so i i actually have to keep it at the back end of the fridge because i risk finishing my own supply and then i am my personal supply chain crisis <laughs> what about what about opening up some a branch of Dafeo in Italy as well I really hope so. I, I, I really, really hope to, to have that um, soon. I'm not sure when. Corona didn't help, but part of me being in March earlier was to try and explore how, um, how it would look like being in, being in Italy. Okay. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, we might soon maybe be able to eat the the one with the brownie. It sounds really delicious. So I hope so. Watch out, Nutella. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you very much once again. Congratulations for all your project and and all your initiatives. Um, they are very very inspiring, and and I hope also that the some people that were listening to us today will have. Um, the opportunity to engage in uh, in some social entrepreneurship after after your advice. So uh, yes, have a nice evening. It was really great to have you with us, and and thank you once again. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share my story, my perspective. Again, uh, I'm super open. If anyone needs some advice in their social enterprise journey or uh, wants to partner in any way for the certification, you know where to find me on LinkedIn. Thank you, Lina. Bye. Bye, bye, everybody. Thank you for being bye -bye. here. Bye. <laughs>